And our guest speaker tonight is Andreas Fertig, who will speak about C20's coroutines for beginners, which I think is a really interesting topic to hear about. And with that, hello, Andreas. Welcome to our user group. Hello, Jens. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I think coroutines are a very interesting topic that C20 brought us. So I'm always happy um, being able to talk about it. So thanks for that opportunity. I'm Andreas Fertig. I work as a trainer and sometimes consultant for C++. I do speak on events like meetups or conferences, and I've written a couple of books. And the one tool that's called C++ Insights that you also might have heard of, um, which now, by the way, uses Clang 18, but um, a blog post is coming about that. C++ 20 school teens. As I said, my name is um, Fertig. That's my last name. And um, some of you might be from Germany, so you know the meaning of Fertig. Um, some of you might come from a different country, so let me briefly explain. My last name is an adjective in German. You can translate it to English as finished, ready, complete, or completed. So very nice adjectives all the time, meaning that you're in a state where, well, you're maybe ready to go to bed or something like that, or your project is, is ready, um, your new release is ready, something like that. So it's a really nice meaning. And it's a frequent word in the German language. We say that a lot of times. The trouble I have often is, um, as an adjective, it's spelled with a lower first letter in German, but um, as my last name, it's spelled with a capital first letter. And um, the spell checker has a very hard time understanding when I'm referring to my name or to the adjective. And we are still sorting that out, and maybe AI will help um, to well, learn at some time that if I write Andreas Fertig, then it refers to my last name. Maybe C++ can help us with that or me. What's about C++ and coroutines? So enough about German, back to C++. One thing that you know are functions, right? There exist in every language um, besides C++ as well. So you know them very well. And now this new thing came along called coroutines. And the question is, what's so great about them and why didn't functions no longer work for these scenarios or do? So on the left, we have a typical control flow of a function call. We have a caller that places a call to a function and that function runs, does whatever it has to do until some point where we return from this function. That can be an early return, that can be a late return. We can have multiple returns in that function. It doesn't matter, you know how the game works. Once you return, you give a result back to the caller. It could also be void. And everything that you computed on in this function on the stack during this call, it's destructed, it goes away. The caller obtains control again and it can call the function again, but it starts from zero, which is a very great um, option usually. Coroutines on the other hand, they provide us with something that they can be resumed, so they preserve their state. My control flow here looks different. So we have a caller that calls our coroutine. And more precisely, it's also referred to as a coroutine function. So it's more or less like a function, but a special one. So my coroutine now takes control and it does some computations and at some point it decides to give control back to the caller. But as opposed to regular functions, a coroutine has the option to co-yield, to co-wait, which isn't shown here, or to co-return. So it's not a sole return. We have multiple options. The co-yield, as I show it here, means we are giving control back to the caller, but the coroutine itself still continues to live. And it still preserves all the state of the, all the computations it has done so far. 
So giving control back to the caller, that means the caller can now do something with the result, very much like if we call a function and get a result there. So caller resumes its regular work, and then at some point it decides to invoke the coroutine function again. And that one now continues where it was left off. So it's resumable. Coroutines are also referred to as resumable functions. So my coroutine in my example here now continues to do some work and at some later point it co-yields another value to the caller. The caller now continues its, its processing and for one final time it invokes the coroutine function again. This one runs at the very end it then co-returns. So if you co-return from a coroutine function, that's very vital. This is very similar to returning from a regular function. It means that a coroutine is finished at this point, so it's fertig, and you're not supposed to invoke this coroutine version again. If you do so, that's undefined behavior, and we don't want that. So this is the big difference between coroutines and functions. Coroutines can be resumed. They preserve their state. All this works roughly that we get a handle of a coroutine, which we will refer to later to resume the coroutine again. This is how we can preserve the state here. And on a bigger picture, coroutines were there first. So coroutines are the superset of functions because a regular function as we have it is just a specialization of a coroutine, which does not Pause. It simply co-returns. You can see it like that. So despite functions in reality were first, coroutines were added later, even not just to C++, but in general to programming languages. Coroutines are the superset. Okay, and regular functions are just a specialization of coroutines. The term coroutine has been well established in computer science since it was first coined by Melvin Conway in 1958. If you look at coroutines across programming languages, you will see two different terms coming up, stack full and stack less coroutines. First of all, C++ implements stack less coroutines. And what is stack less and stack full refers to is what I just showed you in the picture that a coroutine can be resumed, still preserving its state. That's no magic. What we are doing here is we are storing that result somewhere. And this somewhere can either in an implementation be on the stack, so we have a dedicated stack space where we store this coroutine information and all the data on the coroutine stack, or we do not store it on the stack, that means we store it on a heap, so in a special heap allocation or a special heap segment, which is what C++ is doing. This is why we call that one stack less. Okay, the information still has to be stored somewhere, so do not get fooled by that, but we are not using the stack, we are using the heap. It also means that by default, each coroutine you create for the first time does a heap allocation. Okay, There are ways around that, but they are more complicated and do not work all the time, but there are ways. The default is heap allocation. If you're talking about coroutines, you also often talk about cooperative multitasking, versus preemptive multitasking, as you might know it from Stutzrat, for example, which is another interesting property. I will talk about that later. What are coroutines for? Well, coroutines can help you to simplify your code. We can replace some function pointers, aka callbacks, with coroutines, and our code becomes more readable because we see the control flow better. Parsers can become much more readable with coroutines. I wish I would have had um, coroutines in the language years ago, um, some of the parsers I wrote would have been easier to write and to read and to maintain and all that. This is my third point. A lot of the state maintenance code that we usually have in our code for doing things without coroutines, this bookkeeping is now done by the compiler by the coroutine, which means that we are free of doing so. That means our code here becomes, well, less it becomes with that easier to read, to maintain, to bug fix, and all that. So these are interesting features of coroutines. 
how can they interact with the core team? In my initial control flow chart, I already showed you the various options. In C++20, we got three new keywords in the language, co-yield, co-return, and co-await. Co-yield and co-return are more or less an output action. So we pass some information back to the caller. The difference between the two is if I co-yield, the state of my coroutine usually becomes suspended. It means it's pausing and waiting to be resumed or to be destroyed. Co-return, uh, co on the other hand, the state after co-returning is ended. As I already said, you should not invoke a coroutine that co-returned. That's undefined behavior. It's similar to a function that is returned. The third in the game is co-weight. Co-weight is the opposite of co-yield and maybe co-return. It's an input action. So this is how we can, while the coroutine was already started, pass information into the coroutine. The coroutine can say it co-weights for more information. The next byte, the next user input, whatever. So this is an input action. The state of my coroutine is it's usually suspended at this point because it waits for more information. This is like a delayed parameter if you want to a function. So usually we pass or we have to pass all the parameters during the function call to a function. And with co-wait, we have a delayed version asking for more information for the next parameter, so to speak. So these are the three new keywords you have. There's a bit more. What are the elements of a coroutine? In C++, a coroutine consists basically of two um, elements, I would say. The first one is a wrapper type. This is the return type of your coroutine's function's prototype. So if you have a function and you look at the return type, this return type here for coroutine, this is what I refer to as a wrapper type. This wrapper type has a couple of specialties the compiler looks for. And with this wrapper type, we can control the coroutine from the outside world. So this is what we are getting back once we invoke the coroutine for the first time. So this gives us the control over the coroutine. So we can, for example, resume the coroutine or we can pass more data in responding to co-weight. All that by storing a handle of the coroutine in this wrapper type. So in a very simplified model, you can think of a coroutine when you first create it like you're creating a regular object with new. What you get back is a pointer. With this pointer, you can control your object. You can invoke all the member functions you know that are there. And once the coroutine gets created the first time, we are getting such a pointer back, the pointer to the heap handle in the end. And this is stored sometimes, sometimes not in the wrapper type. And if it's stored, it gives us the ability to control the coroutine from the outside world. The second part now that's mandatory is that the compiler looks for a type with the exact name promise type inside this wrapper type. So inside the coroutine's return type. And with this wrapper type, we can control the coroutine from the inside. So we have a lot of customization points there. And this is the part that makes coroutines in C++ less beginner friendly, because you have to configure them as opposed to Python, where you simply can start. Um, this allows us to trim coroutines in C++ to nearly every use case and make it real efficient for all the various use cases. But the one use case that it doesn't excel is starting as a beginner with a coroutine. So you cannot have all. This promise type, the name here, this type, it can either be a type alias, a type def, or you can declare this type directly in the wrapper type. So having a struct inside a struct, for example. There are two optional parts of a coroutine. One is an awaitable type that comes into play once we co-wait. So this is a special thing that we have to care for 
when we go away, I have an example um, for that later. And the fourth part is an iterator, because coroutines can really easily model an infinite stream of data. What we often want to do there is iterate over this data. And this is the iterator part. So the latter two are optional, the first two are mandatory. And with the customization points, I already touched on that point, a coroutine in C++ in the end is a finite state machine that can be controlled and customized via the promise type. So this is the big secret behind them. And the actual coroutine function, which uses co-yield, co-weight, and co-return for communication with the outside world. So this is what we have here. And um, this one gets heavily transformed by the compiler to, well, touch all the hooks we created in our wrapper type. The compiler expects us. So this is the theory behind it. Now we are ready to look at some examples of C coroutines live and in action. But sadly, before doing so, there is a disclaimer. Um, I wish I wouldn't have to put it in there, but I felt it's necessary. In my experience, coroutines in C++ are a somewhat difficult topic, mainly, I think, because of the customization points. So. I wanted to give you an overview about coroutines and do not distract you by other parts of the language that you might or might not be familiar. It's simply a risk of distracting you. So I try to keep the code that you will see on the next following slides as simple as possible. I wanted to focus on coroutines only. In production code, I work with way more public and private as well as potential getters and setters. Additionally, usually I use way more generic, generic code in production to keep repetitions low. I decided to totally get rid of templates for this talk. Um, my goal here is to help you understand coroutines or make you familiar with them. And I'm confident that you can improve the code that you will see with the usual C++ best practices yourself. Okay, so that's all fine. There is one little caveat. Um, I also never declare more than one variable per line. Believe me, I, I teach that. Um, slide code, and to be precise, this talk is um, so far the only exception. So bear with me there, sorry for that, but I only have so much slide space. So here's our first coroutine. Our coroutine here at the top in line number one in A is called pop. And what fun returns here is a type called chat. Okay, so we haven't seen chat yet, comes in the following slides, but we know it's the return type. If you're looking in the body of fun, we can see it has a co yield, a co weight, and co return in it. So I'm really happy I could squeeze all three in. But nevertheless, one would be enough to say, okay, this is a co routine. So this is a similar check that the compiler does. And that means the compiler and we know that chat is a wrapper type. It must contain a type called promise type. If that's not a case, this code would not compile. So we know that without knowing anything else about chat. Now what my coroutine does is in B here, it co-yields a std string hello. In C then, it co-waits for another std string. So I'm simply using the type here waiting for a new std string and printing that one out to see out. And finally in D, the coroutine co-returns here. So that's all this coroutine does. I use it down in use in E here. I'm invoking the coroutine fun for the first time. And that means I'm getting back a pointer. So basically behind this fun call, there is an allocation, a new. And I get this pointer nicely wrapped back in the chat object. So chat here, I call this variable Marco, now controls or holds the ability to control the coroutine. The first thing I do here in F then is I call Marco.listen. So Marco listens to 
the noise that's around here using the coroutine. And then in G, Marco answers to something he heard and says, where are you? And then finally in H, Marco listens again with the coroutine. So you haven't seen all the functions, that's fine for now. If I would execute this coroutine, the coroutine would say, hello, and Marco would say, where are you? And the coroutine would reply here. So a very basic chatty thing. So that's all it takes, right? And this code here, it's really nice. Fun doesn't have to store any state where it left off. It can simply continue. So for us humans, control for vice, this is really nice to read. And I would be really happy if we could stop here and um, that's all about coroutines, but it isn't. So we need this wrapper type. But inside this wrapper type, we have this promise type. So let's look at the promise type first. In A here, at the top, you can see uh, the real tragedy. I have these two std string variables declared in one line. And I picked two because I wanted to make it clear that one holds the data that goes out of the coroutine and the other one holds the data that goes into the coroutine. Technically, I would need two variables because I know they do not overlap, but this is the easier to read version, I guess. So coroutines can hit exceptions. Um, what to do then and how we control that is out of scope for this talk. But in B here, we look at the first customization point for our coroutine, unhandled exception. You have to spell all the customization points exactly as on the slide. In um, the case of final suspend, it must be no except. For the others, no except is somewhat optional and the return types can also vary. The first customization point that we need, I would say all the time, is the one in C, get return object. Get return object gives us a way to construct a chat object, the wrapper type around it, and return it. The difficulty here from a compiler's perspective is the compiler doesn't know this type chat. So does it have one parameter, two, three, four? What are they in types, references, pointers, and so forth? And it's hard to teach the compiler that. So the easiest way is let a compiler call a function like get return object. And in that we as programmers can define how to call this function. We create an object and simply return it. So this is the entry point. This is where the compiler gets the ability to create a chat object without knowing what constructors exist and so forth. Now, once this coroutine was created, the first thing the compiler does after a couple of bookkeeping things is it hits the first suspension point called initial suspend. So that is a very early one. You can say it's the one after the curly brace opens, something like that. So the coroutine has been allocated, the parameters have been transferred to the coroutine frame and local variables if necessary, things like that. So this is where you can decide to pause. This is what my coroutine here does. It says suspend always. Or you could also say continue to the first real suspension point by returning in other new type here, suspend never. Suspend always and suspend never are two helper types. We will see them later that C20 gave us. They, the names hopefully speak for themselves and um, technical details aside. This is what initial suspend here does. The first Real suspension point in my case for the coroutine fun here is when I say co yield for the first time. So that would F be F here, yield value. Yield value is one more customization point. I return suspend always. So that means after I'm yielding, the coroutine is suspended. And as parameter to, to yield value, I can take everything I want. So every type that's known in the type system at this point, it can be a pointer, a reference, an R value reference, a contra reference, and so forth. So you have the full flexibility. 
It can also be a throwing function. In my case, I simply um, do not throw here. So no except is fine. Just fine tuning. What I do in yield value is I take the std string by copy and then move it into MSG out. And after that, returning suspend always default constructed. Because fun also contains a co weight, I have to handle that one. And there is a customization point called await transform, which is C and G, which here is invoked with a std string parameter. It's the same pattern as for yield value. We can have different overloads to these customization points to take parameters. We could have one for std string, one for int, and so forth, and they get overloaded. So my await transform here is the reason why I co-weighted for a std string object for an empty one to invoke the function G or the customization point in G await transform here. Array transform now does something that I started doing more and more with coroutines. It declares a struct waiter inside this function because it's only needed and required there and only makes sense there. A waiter stores a reference to the promise type and it declares the three member functions await ready, await resume, and await suspend. These are three more customization points that are abstracted in other cases by suspend always or suspend never. They implement the same thing. So here is my own version. Await ready return, returns true. Await resume here. This is invoked when the coroutine gets resumed. And that means I'm moving the message I stored um, into the internals of the coroutine. So to my C out inside fun. And Await suspend allows me to be notified when the coroutine gets suspended and getting to know the coroutine handle of this coroutine. And I have an example for when that's interesting later. So then I'm returning a freshly created await struct at this point. And um, the final two customization points we have are return value and final suspend. Return value is different to the others because it always returns void. It's returned, so we cannot decide whether to resume the coroutine or not. The rest is the same. I can have return value for a std string for an int overload. If the rest of the machinery here can handle that, that's totally fine for the compiler. I take a std string like in yield value by copy and move it to MSG out in I here. And then finally, in final suspend, I simply do nothing returning a suspend always. I can also decide to say never here. That means the coroutine would flow um, to the end of the control flow and to some degree destroy itself. I have an example for that also um, in a different context later. So this is the promise type. And then here is the wrapper type chat. Line number two here is also somewhat unnice. I'm not doing that in production code. This should simply visualize for you that the promise type that I just showed you on the previous slide goes there, copy and paste, basically. So what my coroutine chat here does, or my wrapper type, is in A, I'm creating a coroutine handle. A std coroutine handle is a new data type in C20 typed with my promise type. And then I use that to say that chat here now takes a promise type by reference and it evokes a static member function from promise on this coroutine handle um, for my promise type. And this one is able to convert a promise type to a coroutine handle. So it fetches the pointer that's behind that stored in some compiler handled translation table. That's all. So this is my constructor. Because of this handle thing, because this is much like a pointer, your wrapper type most often should not be copyable because then you're duplicating the pointer and you destroy one object and the other one, well, doesn't work anymore. Typical issues with pointers here. So this is why in C here, I'm saying my coroutine is move only by 
providing only this function, I automatically disable the copy operations. And there I'm simply exchanging the handles from the right hand side to my side and stored. This handle is also the reason for the constructor that you can see in D here. If this wrapper type here gets destroyed, I have to take care of the coroutine handle. So I check whether the handle is still valid. And if so, I call destroy on the handle that frees the memory behind the coroutine and the coroutine ensures that all the objects on it get destroyed first. And then we have in E and F the two member functions that you previously saw being used. So listen here returns a std string. It checks whether the coroutine is not already done by invoking done on the handle. And if so, it resumes the coroutine by using the coroutine handles resume function. Once the coroutine has been resumed and suspended itself again, I'm using a std move using the handle to get to the promise type, reaching for the MSG out variable, moving that one out of listen, returning it to the caller, in my case, Marco. Answer is the other way around. I receive a std string. I move that into the coroutines promise types MSG in variable, and I'm checking whether the coroutine is not already finished. And if that's the case, I resume it. You should never invoke a coroutine that's already finished or done. That would be undefined behavior again. So these are the pieces in code that we need to make our coroutine work. In the picture shown on the left, we have the user written code. So this is what was in the function use previously. I have this coroutine creation, storing that in the um, variable Marco, and then I have the invocation of listen, answer, and listen again. We also saw the wrapper type chat. And this wrapper type now, it must contain a promise type, but what this promise type contains, aside from the customization points, the comp compiler doesn't border. So that I have two std string variables in there, it's totally optional to the machinery. It's just required for us to store the information somewhere. And the same is true for the two member functions, listen and answer in the wrapper type. This is my design. You can spell answer differently. You can spell listen differently. You can avoid them totally and give the outside world access to the coroutine handle. That's all fine. That I store the coroutine handle in the wrapper type, that's also optional to the compiler. It's necessary for my application, but in, there are others where it's not required. And the third box on the right, this is the compiler implementation. This is the hardest part about coroutines in general here for compilers, because my actual coroutine function, the one where I'm saying co-yield, co-weight, and co-return, that gets transformed. So all the calls to co-yield, for example, get transformed to call to yield value of my promise type. So this one gets heavily transformed by the compiler. The other part is the parameters to this function or all local variables. They are not on the stack as usual. The compiler transforms them to point to data on the coroutine frame, even the parameters. So they get copied there. So this is when the compiler does the heap allocation for the coroutine frame and it places all the parameters into local variables in that coroutine frame. So this is the compiler part and this is where the heavy transformation happens. All right, so our first coroutine, excellent. I have a few more and for them I have two definitions. The rest of this talk I will refer to a task as a coroutine that does a job without returning a value. And the generator donates to a coroutine that does a job and returns a value either with coroutine or co-yield, okay? So for now, these are the two definitions for the rest. Excellent. I promised you showing you the helper types. So here are the two helper types for my coroutine, suspend always and suspend never. They come in the C++ 20 STL, so you do not have to write them yourself. The only difference between the two is the await ready result. Await ready, for always 
returns false and return or await ready for suspend never returns true. Okay, the nice names should all only indicate what's happening. And I already showed you with my awaiter that we can implement these customization points ourselves. And there are a couple of examples coming where we do this more excessively. Good. So let's have a look at another task for a core team interleaving two stood up stood vector objects. What I mean by that is I have a stood vector A and a stood vector B both filled with a couple of integers. And the result that I want to print out is one element from vector A, one element from vector B, one element from A, from B, and so forth. So interleaving the two. If one runs out of elements, only the other one um, continues to be printed out. So how do we do, we do that with coroutines? Here's my approach. We are looking at the coroutine itself. This time it's called interleaved. It takes two std vector objects of type int by copy. And it returns a generator object. So once we start scanning this function, we can see in line number four a co yield. So we're talking about coroutine. That means generator here is a promise and must contain a promise type. It is a wrapper type. Starting to look into interleaved, I managed to squeeze lambdas into this talk because lambdas can be coroutines as well. So the first thing I'm doing here, line number three, I'm declaring this lambda lamp. And that one does not capture anything, but it takes a std vector of int by reference. And it also returns via the trading return type, a generator object here. And internally, it uses a range-based for loop to loop over this vector of all the elements and yield each element from this coroutine. So this is a nice and easy way to get a stream of data that can be interrupted. I use this lambda now to create two more coroutines, so actual coroutines this time in X and epsilon in line number seven and eight by invoking the lambda with the two parameters A and B subsequently. And then I'm using this coroutines X and epsilon in line number 10 in a while loop. This is another pattern that you will see, I would say often with coroutines, this infinite loops that are terminated by some other condition than really um, the one that we know of. So in my case here, I'm calling x.finished and epsilon.finished. So I'm checking basically, is this coroutine x or the coroutine epsilon not yet finished? And if so, I go into the wilds body. And there I do this check again. So I'm checking first, is x not finished? If so, then I'm co-yielding x dot value and next i'm resuming x so we have the functions finished value and resume here this must be functions member functions of my generator type we will see them later and then i'm doing the same thing for epsilon so that means that thing here checks first that a in x is not finished if so it yields a value from x and then continues or resumes the coroutine of x and then it goes to epsilon and does the same thing for epsilon. And would one of them run out of values, it would simply no longer be processed, but the other one would still generate values. So this is in 21 lines, how we can interleave coroutines without looking at the promise type and the wrapper type, right? My promise type this time luckily is, I would say short. So the promise type here stores an int member val. It implements get return object by returning a generator. The pattern is the same as for chat. I'm passing a dereference this pointer here. I implement initial suspend by saying this time never and doing nothing, just returning that. Final suspend says always and yield value says also always it takes an int parameter stores that internally and then we have return void here doing nothing this is what's required if you do not have a cool return in your coroutine so you cannot have a return value then you have to uh, implement return void 
despite it not being doing anything here. And I'm not handling exceptions so that uh, customization point is also empty. The interesting thing here is my initial suspend because this time I'm saying suspend never. That means once the coroutine gets created, I continue running until I hit the first real suspension point. And this is vital for the code that I just showed you because there the order was yield a value from X and then resume X. And this is only possible because X already holds a value because it reached the first non-initial suspension point. Here is the implementation of my wrapper type generator. As previously with the fun or chat example, I'm storing a coroutine handle M handle here. My constructor takes a promise type by reference, converts that into a coroutine handle. It's move only. It cares in the destructor about destroying the coroutine handle. Value now uses the handle to reach the promise type and we start getting access, access to the value member. Finished checks whether the coroutine is done or not and resume uses finished to check whether it can resume the coroutine. So these are the um, member functions that you saw before. So, and this time the code is shorter than I would say for the chat version. And this gives you the ability to interleave the two to vector objects as I shown you. The usage here is the following. I have the std vectors A and B. I'm calling my coroutine interleaved here, moving the two std vector objects into interleaved, getting back a generator object. And I'm now using that with this while loop here, checking that my coroutine isn't finished. And if not, I'm see outing the value stored in the coroutine. And after that, I'm resuming it. Well, that's easy, okay? Is it? I mean, yeah, the coroutine works. I like it. I don't like this part particularly. I don't like the while loop, um, the previous one, all right, that gets hidden into the coroutine, but this is the code that users have to write. And that one is not nice. It also has the risk that somebody calls resume before calling value. And either it crashes or the people then miss a value. So that's, that's not great, not at all. So I would say the next task is that we require a Blastic Surgeon, not a regular one, one for code this time. So not changing your skin or so. I'm sure you also would like to use a range-based for loop instead of the while loop that I just showed you, right? So let's make that happen. Let's see what's necessary. To achieve that, we need an iterator. So this the third part, or initially it was the first item on the elements of a coroutine that I showed you. So an iterator must satisfy the iterator concept. That means it must be not equal, comparable, incrementable, and dereferenceable. What you see in code on the right here is such an iterator. I store a coroutine handle here. I implement the equals operator. I'm on the positive side and in C++20, the compiler understands to transform a not equal to an equals equals. So I'm implementing that one here. That one takes a sentinel. There's a stood default sentinel in C++20 because I do not care about the value from the other side. The coroutine itself knows when it's finished with its function done. So I'm using that to get the knowledge whether the coroutine is done or not transferred out. I implement the pre-increment operator here. That one resumes the coroutine and after that returns a reference to itself. And I implement the dereference operator. That one fetches the value with the promise type via the handle and returns the integer here. So this is the iterator part. That's I would say, all right. What's missing here to make the whole machinery work is our generator must now consist of the two member functions, begin and end. The other version would be using free functions, but it's more complicated for that example. So let's use the member functions. So begin here returns a 
new constructed iterator object where I pass the handle to that stored in generator and end returns a default sentinel. So this makes the machinery work and the iterator encapsulates everything. This brings us to the much nicer code at the bottom right of this slide here. I have, as previously, my two stood vectors A and B with a couple of numbers in it. I call it a lift, moving the two stood vectors into that coroutine. I'm getting back a generator here, or an object of type generator. And now, thanks to what we just did to the coroutine, I can use a range based for loop, looping over the values from this generator and nicely seouting them. So this is a real cool abstraction because this is easy to use and very hard to misuse. So APIs should be like that. The previous version with the while loop was way too easy to, well, get yourself in trouble. So this is why iterators often come with coroutines in C20 or in C++ in general now. All right, that was interleaving two stood vectors. What's next? Well, another task is scheduling multiple tasks, right? Why not? So how does that look like? But first, let's compare cooperative to preemptive multitasking. Preemptive multitasking, as I initially said, is the thing you get if you're using a stood thread. That means um, the thread itself has no control over when it runs, on which CPU it runs, or for long, how long it runs. This is controlled by the operating system. This is often real good. We want this, um, the thread should simply run as efficiently as possible and so forth. But sometimes we want a different level of control. And this brings us to cooperative multitasking. There the thread decides for how long it runs and when it's time to give up control to another thread. Okay, these are two interesting features. You can actually also try to pin it to a CPU, but let's neglect that one. One major difference between the two um, things you can have here, the two different ways, is instead of locks in preemptive multitasking, we use co-yield or co-weight in cooperative multitasking. So you practically can go lock free because your thread now controls when it gives up control and it can do that when it knows it processed all the data, something like that. So that makes your code easier, but you get different properties. How does it look like? Let's say I have a scheduler here. I want to implement something like a very simple operating system. I have the scheduler in line number three and call it scheduler. And after two tasks, task A and B. And I pass a scheduler to them. And then I'm invoking the scheduler, scheduling the tasks until there's nothing more to schedule. And then I would return. So this is the overall picture. My two threads or two tasks A and B here look like this. They're more or less exactly similar to each other. There's only a slight difference in what they print out. So task A says, for example, hello from task A, while task B says hello from task B. So this is basically the only difference. The one says A, the other one says B. Both take a scheduler object by reference, both return a task object, and both print out something, and then they use co-weight and use that together with sked.suspend. So this is here my suspension point. This is where I give up control to the other tasks. So where either A gives up control to B or vice versa. As long as I'm not saying co-weight, I'm uninterruptible, assuming you're not using um, preemptive multitasking with threads as well in parallel. So what does the implementation look like? First of all, here's my scheduler. My scheduler uses a std list of coroutine handles. This is a special coroutine handle. As you can see, it's typed with nothing, so it's a void coroutine handle. And this is enough for me in this scenario because all I want to do is resume a coroutine. And for that, I don't need to know the specific type of this coroutine handle. So this is type erasure to my benefits. I call this list tasks here, and then I have my 
function schedule. Schedule pops the first item from the list, checks whether this coroutine isn't done, and if so, it gets resumed. And as a result of schedule, the answer to is tasks empty or not gets returned. So are there more tasks to get scheduled? Suspend looks a little bit like what we saw previously with um, await suspend. I'm creating a awaiter struct. This time a slight variation I'm deriving from suspend always. Just to show you that this is also possible, I'm doing that because I basically implement this to suspend always here. The, different is, the difference is my await suspend. So my awaiter here stores a reference to the scheduler. And this is why I need the constructor here to set up this reference. But the only thing I really want to override from suspend always is await suspend. Because this time I'm interested in the coroutine handle. Once the coroutine gets paused, my await suspend gets invoked and I'm using that to reaching for the scheduler's task list and push back this coroutine handle. So this is how I insert it into my task list. And as a result of suspend, I'm returning such an awaiter struct constructed with the referencing um, the this pointer, essentially getting a reference to the scheduler there. So this is my scheduler. You can perfect that way more. It's a very simple, non-sophisticated scheduler, but it does the job. And this brings us to the potentially shortest promise type and wrapper type that you can encounter. It's my wrapper type task, which contains my promise type here. Get return object returns a default constructed task object. Nothing to do here. Initial suspend says never. I want the task to start directly. You can control it here. You can also say, well, I want to kick it off at some point, so do not um, start yourself initially. And suspend, final suspend says also suspend, never. So this helps me here because task doesn't store the handle of the coroutine. This helps me that a compiler can clean up this coroutine automatically. I do not core return, so I implement the customization point return void, leave that one empty, and I'm not handling exceptions. So that's it. These are all the ingredients to need you need to build yourself a very simple schedule. What if you want to implement a variant of that? Variation. Let's say you want to be able to spawn tasks without knowing the scheduler. That means we most likely have a global scheduler. I'm trying to indicate that in line number six by naming the variable now G scheduler or global scheduler. But my tasks A and B, they no longer take a parameter. The rest remains awfully the same. Here are my two tasks, A and B. As previously, with a slight um, variation, they obviously do not take any parameters anymore. And that means my core weight can no longer reach for the scheduler. I could, of course, here now invoke the global scheduler, G scheduler, but let's say we do not want to do that. I'm co-waiting on a new created object of type suspend here. So I'm always creating a new object here. So slight variation. What does that mean? Well, for my scheduler itself, it doesn't mean very much. I changed a couple of things. So now I have a suspend function here that takes a coroutine handle and pushes things back to the list. That's just a small beautification. And I have my schedule function. That's exactly the same as before. Getting the first entry from the list, checking whether it's done or not, and returning whether there are still tasks in the list to process. The major change is this one here. In line number one, I have a global scheduler object. Now I made that one static. And in line number three, you see the new type, the new struct, suspend. And suspend, and this is the reason why I wanted to show you that, implements a core weight operator. So in C++20, among a lot of other things, you also got a new operator, and this is the core weight operator. And that comes into play with coroutines where we say co-weight. 
And the nice thing here is now that is more or less stateless. I implement my operator here. I use the same trick as before. I say I declare a struct awaiter that one derives from suspend always, and it overrides the await suspend um, member function here or customization point. Doing the same thing as before, taking the coroutine handle as a parameter and using the global scheduler object to push it to the list of tasks. So this would be a way where you can say, okay, you want to suspend on different schedulers. So you can have different suspend types that then hook you to the different schedulers. So this is another way of implementing a scheduler in C++. In general, it's always about scheduling when you're looking at coroutines. Even for my coroutine chat, I had a scheduler. I didn't name it that way, but my function use did schedule the coroutine because it decided when to resume it and when to put data into it. So this is one instance that you always need with coroutines, the controlling instance, whether you call this a scheduler or something else, but you need something that handles your coroutines. Okay, it's very important. Coroutines come with a couple of restrictions or limitations. A const explorer function cannot be a coroutine. Subsequently, the same is true for const eval functions available in C++ 20. So we are not doing, at least at the moment, coroutines at compile time. Neither a constructor nor destructor can be a coroutine. If you well, briefly think about that. I think it makes sense. Um, what would a half constructed or half destructed object mean? So this is not possible. It's all or nothing in this case. A function using var args cannot be a coroutine. And these var args are the stuff we inherited from C. So if you're looking at a printf function um, where you have the three dots this place via the stack, and this cannot be a coroutine. A veridic function template, on the other hand, works because this is a template, so we know all the types, everything is preserved, so that one works with the coroutine. A function with plain auto as a return type or with a concept type cannot be a coroutine. Auto with training return type, on the other hand, works. I showed you the case with the lambda, and there I showed you the training return type. May Lambda would otherwise default to returning auto, and that's not possible. So we need to tell the compiler which coroutine it returns or what the wrapper type looks like in this case. So further, a coroutine cannot use plain return. That leads to an error. You must either use coreturn or core yield. And last but not least, some other thing that cannot be a coroutine is main. The same thing as for a constructor would apply, but would a suspended main mean you need something from the outside that resumes it? But well, what's that? That um, top level main. So main cannot be a coroutine as well. And lambdas, I showed you that they can be coroutines, but you have to watch out and use the trailing return type. This is coroutines in C20. I hope. Um, you learned something today and it could, well, gain your interest for coroutines. I think they are a real great tool for C++ 20 and 23 and all the upcoming standards. If you have more interest in coroutines, you can head over to my newsletter and subscribe and getting a coroutine cheat sheet. It contains three pages relating to the talk here where I try to you know, summarize um, very briefly how you can interact with coroutines and so forth. There is a, a longer chapter, a dedicated chapter, in fact, in my programming with C++ 20 book. So you can also um, check that one out. Or of course, there are plenty of talks recorded on YouTube, either by myself or by others talking and teaching coroutines. I hope you had fun with that. And um, for my part, I am Fertig and waiting for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. That was a great talk. Um, 
especially about coroutines. So let's see, you know, let's go away the questions. All right. So, um, you already quickly mentioned 23. So just let's start with, you know, what, what's going to make it easier with coroutines in 23. Um, so 23 gives you std generator. Um, std generator is a type that's, uh, yeah, that was missed in C++ 20 because we have to write all this boilerplate code ourselves. Um, for a lot of use cases, I think std generator is a helpful new element in the standard library, but you will now probably find out um, after using it for a while that it does not satisfy all the use cases. So I didn't apply to generator here for this talk because um, it does not work, um, I think, in all my cases. Because that one is more driven from a ranges part of you where you get a constant stream of data which you loop over. But it's hard to interrupt them and so forth. So for some scenarios, it's a great thing, but this showed that um, providing a library type, which is a question that very often comes up, um, why do we have to write all this boilerplate code? Coming up with a library type is very difficult because coroutines are so flexible, so every type we can come up with likes to generator limits them. And for some of us, this is great because this is what we need, what we want, and for us, it simply doesn't work. So other than um, the generator, I'm not aware of other changes to coroutines in C++ 23, sorry. All right. So the next question is from Or. Not sure if I understand if coroutines can run parallel like threads or if each time it progresses a different part function. Okay, that's a good question. Um, one can argue that even your threads do not run in parallel um, because uh, even there you have a scheduler that decides that, but you can, of course, distribute them on different cores. So coroutine in the end is a function. That means one runs at a time. It runs until it co-returns, it co-waits or co-yields. Okay, this is the suspension point that gives another coroutine a chance to run. Um, I hope my um, schedule example maybe illustrated that a little um, or the chat example before. You can also use that in a way that it chats with different people. But it does not run in parallel in the usual sense we mean it when we are looking at, for example, std thread. You can, of course, mix things. So we can mix coroutines with std thread. Um, a thread can invoke a coroutine and pass that one to another thread, such that that executes it further and so forth. But I think for, yeah, for simplifications, it's easiest to think about coroutines as functions and they themselves do not run in parallel. I hope that helps. Yeah, I think um, parallelism is a different context than, and coroutines do not parallelize by themselves. Yeah, um, the, the interleaf, I think that's um, that's yeah. a good uh, thing to seed. With respect to restrictions, how deep can a chain of coroutines go, e a coroutine calling another coroutine calling another coroutine, in particular with regards to the frames that are stored on the heap? Well, I would say you can go as deep as you have heap for that. Um, so there are no restrictions. You you can in fact um, have coroutines inside coroutines. Um, so generator in C plus plus twenty three supports that elegantly. Um, the only thing really that limits that is your heap in the end. Um, so you can do it. Yep. Um, 
Question of standardization. Do you know why, when all, and when any coroutine versions have not been accepted to 23? Do you know why? I have not been have not been accepted to C plus plus. Okay, um, no, um, I I don't know, or at least I don't recall. Um, Are you involved in the committee with coroutines? I mostly spend my time in EWWG, and this is more library question. So, um, no, not 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 really. So the the standardizing questions or the future questions or what what should be standardized is probably. Um, so, yeah. uh, one thing I want to say is like keep your questions on LinkedIn short um, because this is a bit too long. Um, Thanks, Andreas. Your first slide was coroutines versus functions, and the main idea was to retain state. Maybe an additional slide with coroutines versus functors as functions with state would be relevant. Uh, people have been using functors for this for decades, implementing simple state machines, and I wonder how much uh, more convenient is using coroutines for this versus the old way. Maybe there are subtil subtleties or not clear to newcomers justifying addition to the standard. Yes, um, thank you for that. Um, I have a longer version of this talk, but this also usually does only touch on the surface. Um, showing the difference between functors or um, callbacks and all that stuff. And coroutines usually requires a bit more code and with that a bit more context. So a, a month ago, I think more or less today, I did a class um, at CPP online, um, a, a one day training about coroutines and there was time for that because this is the, the real interesting part, but it's um, I haven't found a nice way to capture it in, in one slide or, or to, to um, yeah, yeah, compare the two to each other. I have one, um, if you want to reach for that, um, I gave a talk, an extended version of that one at CPP North last year. Um, after the first hour, I show a, um, a parser implemented in a more traditional way compared to a coroutine function, but it requires simply more time for this talk and it's still not... Um, not sufficient, but this can give you a better picture of, of how the two compare. If a coroutine runs for very long, will it be preempted? No, um, it will never. So you are in full, full control. That means you are responsible for that. Um, if, if you're counting CPU cycles or things like that, and you can try to trim it very nicely to the cycles you have left or the time, let's say in milliseconds, your operation takes. But if one violates these rules and takes a minute where only 10 seconds were allowed, you have to, well, detect the situation and um, reboot or terminate whatever. Um, you cannot preempt a coroutine. It's a function. You cannot interrupt the function aside from sets. Okay. Um, Paul asks, will coroutines affect how we code with Boost ASIO? That's a tough question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. Um, there is a, another feature, another library feature in the pipeline for C++ 26 um, senders and receivers. And I think that one matches more closely what Boost ACO does than coroutines. I think you can do similar stuff with coroutines and maybe more easily or more with the standard, but um, I think senders and receivers will get you even closer by um, yeah, providing you um, standard elements by the standard. Also, I think it 
depends a bit on AGO. If AGO provides basically implementation of coroutines so that you can actually, you know, co-await an AGO function. Um, because as far as I understand, that is like a library thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, um, VHS stuff asks like, where do we have more information on this topic resources links? Um, I would simply ask the chat to post things and pages they know about, and maybe also Andreas to do that later. And, um, so, um, Andreas has a website, as you see, he, he links to Fatic to subscribe where you can go, uh, can have us, um, coroutine cheat, 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 no, no, cheat, sheet. that's the way. And there's, uh, his book. So, um, these links are probably helpful and Andreas can, you know, probably add a link to his blog, etc. um, to the chat later. Um, what added coroutines brought that, oh, no, what, you know, basically what's the difference or like, you know, multi-threading is different from what coroutine is doing. And I know that's just like a difference which a lot of people don't really, um, understand so much. Um, yeah, that's another good question. Um, there are the two models are fundamentally different. So, um, coroutines because they can suspend at a point, um, and can be invoked later and preserving their state. They are real great tools for the already mentioned parser to implement. Um, you multi-threading does not do you any good there. Um, the other thing is I, um, it depends on, um, on the, the, the task you really have. Um, in in this, this one day training I did, I compared coroutines to threads. And my example there was a very simple ping pong. So one thread says ping, the other one says pong. So one comes, the other one comes and so forth. And I did the same with coroutines and I let it run for whatever, um, thousand turns or something like that. And um, in each and every try the coroutines did beat threads by a lot because they are log free. And if you have such a pattern, then you might look for coroutines because they can save you time. You also are out of all this, oh, I did forget to lock a data structure and now I have corrupted my data. Um, this does not happen there, or at least not that easily. So this is only true if they do more or less the same things. Um, once you do more ready like things, then coroutine might be the wrong tool. So we had this question before, if you do not want to care when to give up control, then coroutines are obviously the wrong tool for you. Okay, you, you want to get interrupted like with a stood thread, not notice that and everything is good. So it's just a, a addition to your tool set that you can use now in in different or new places or exchange it with existing implementation. As I said, parsers getting easier. There's nothing that's really nice to solve with two threads. Um, if you have simple tasks, coroutines might be faster than two threads. And coroutines are lock free, so you do not have to care about locks there. So these are variations. And of course, you, as I already I think mentioned before, you can mix the two together. So that makes it even yeah, more interesting. I hope this answers the question. Um, one thing I've noticed with your generator example was that it's basically very similar to the zip view, which we get with uh, 23. So I wanted to ask you like, you know, um, would that be better? What's the difference to like using coroutines and to use as a view. I saw implementations using coroutines implementing that zip view. I'm not sure what they finally do, 
Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're not using coroutines, but it might depend on your perspective. If you're the user, then you might not care which one of the two you're using. If you're an implementer, you might care about which one you're implementing. Um, in the end, I understand they are both doing or they are both giving you the same result. Um, Coroutines uh, for sure coroutines need an allocation. Underneath. Sorry? So basically what you're saying is that the coroutines are potentially the implementation of the zip view. I, I remember or I think remember seeing one implementation like that, yes, but I'm not sure if this is the final implementation because the core team would do a heap allocation. And I'm not sure we want that with the zip view. So, yeah, th this is, um, I, I would assume they're not using coroutines, but I'm not 100% sure. Well, uh, sure. Regarding usage examples, in addition to parsers, could you name more of the typical examples and use cases where using coroutines would be beneficial? Well, parsers is, um, I did a lot of networking, so I wrote a lot of parsers. Um, this is my usual example. But what they usually have is um, some way, uh, some callback informing you that you received enough data to form whatever it is you want a frame or something like that and um, this is a callback so callbacks are essentially the other example or, or the the broader topic of examples in um, in mac os there is a um, a way to register for hotkeys for hotkey events if i press um Apple T or something like that, that can be notified. This is a typical example. I have this register function where I pass a callback to, and that one gets called later, and I'm not seeing why and where and so forth. With a coroutine, you can register there and get paused until you or your user hits the corresponding key action, and you get resumed exactly at a point where you left off. Okay, so you see this handler a little bit better and you do not have to play this indirection, at least visually for our eyes, with the function pointer. So function pointers are something that you can get rid of in a couple of places at least and replace them with coroutines. And it always boils down to your code becoming more readable because you then see better what's going on and where you left off. This is something I can offer from the top of my head. Um, yeah, I think we had the zip view examples, so things like that. I think that's something I can agree with. That basically, when you have a callback, and you, you then you can call co await and you know pass the context of the current running function into the next function, and then wait until uh, that returns the value you usually would get to the callback. Okay, there's an SDL question. Um, will the parallel SDL algorithm execution policies gain a coroutine version? Uh, would that be useful? So it's once again more for library evolution. Um, I haven't okay. heard of such a proposal. Um, I'm not sure if it would be useful because remember, it would not be really parallel. So you have to give up control. And I'm not sure if for these types of algorithms, this is an interesting feature. Yeah. I think that is um, from the extensive of questions I can see currently everything in the chat. If you have really a question, um, add it to the chat. Um, so there's one thing I see here is like, um, 
coroutines are not for I.O., okay? Um, they can be used for that, but there's other use cases for I.O., for, for coroutines than I.O., right? Mm. I'm not sure um, what's really meant here, but um, coroutines, for example, could in fact be a nice tool to, um, if you're on the microcontroller and um, one event happened and you have to read that one, let's say data from the serial um, port and simply write it in a buffer, things like that. I think that could be a candidate for a coroutine instead of a thread, um, especially if you go with low resources, you might not have threads available, but you can pause there, wait for more data, and, and then um, say, okay, I've received enough here, um, somebody handle that. But uh, yeah, maybe a question is too broad to really yeah. say yes or no I um, think I, I, yeah. you showed the scheduler example which you know basically could be used as a game loop which yes. runs on CPU and GPU so um, it can be used for IO and IO is definitely a use case when you like you know, have a function opening a file and you wait for that in the code and um, but it's not the only use case and it's not meant for it to be like IO uh, we still need to counterpart to SD format to get rid of uh, IO streams. So that brings us to the end. Thank you for your talk, Andreas. Um, any last words? Um, well, um, thank you for having me. Um, enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are, and um, hopefully until another time. There are some more questions. Um, oh, okay. nice. Um, actually, you, you mentioned embedded. Now we get an embedded yeah. question. Uh, sure. Do we need special OS support when using coroutines? For instance, an embedded system where we run RTOS like for your RTOS. That's a very, very good question. And the nice answer for you is you don't. Um, this is the one of the major differences between StudThread and Coroutines. For StudThread, you always need operating system support. Coroutines are a language or a compiler um, feature. The compiler does a lot of heavy lifting there. But in the end, because we are simply talking about interleaved functions, there is no support from your operating system required. In fact, your operating system will not know um, whether you are using coroutines or not. The only thing that you need, which makes it a little bit um, difficult for embedded systems, is heap access. As I said, you can try to control that, but then things get more difficult. But this is, um, yeah, this is the only thing. Um, is there still a chance for stack for coroutines in C++? I would say yes. Um, in the beginning, there were proposals for stack full, what we went for stack less. So if one brings a proposal for stack full coroutines, um, outlining where they are beneficial, yeah, um, I would think so. I had the machinery for most of the things, I think, wouldn't care whether we're using stack full or stack less. Um, so yeah, that, that could be possible. And as you're hinting that, you know, heap allocations are not needed. Uh, are coroutines allocator aware? No, not in the sense like other STL elements. You, you have the basically the option to provide your own operator new and delete for your promise type or for your wrapper type. Um, so you, mainly you are allocators for coroutines. Sorry? Well, I, I was thinking about like PMR allocators already give you very nice control on where your memory comes from. This is, yeah, that would be one solution, but it's not that you have a, um, a parameter or template type where you can pass in your allocator. So it's by overloading the operator new and delete 
or your promise type mainly. And the tricky part there, just to dive into that, is knowing the size. So you mm -hmm. will get an allocation request that is larger than your promise type's size because the coroutine frame requires some bookkeeping. And True. in addition to that, the coroutine frame also stores the parameters to your function. So this is what makes it tough. And um, I, yeah, this is, this is what basically makes it hard. So you have to over allocate to be sure that everything um, fits. But once you solve that, you can go with PMR, with your own hand-rolled um, stack allocator or whatever you have. But also then we left the uh, beginner's guide to coroutines for a long while, I guess. Um, yes. But it's nice to know that this is possible. And I see someone posts a link to this. Um, and we have now like more than 20 minutes of questions. Um, so thank you, Andreas. Um, if there's any more questions later in the chat, because people are going to watch this tonight, um, maybe, you know, Andreas can take a look at this tomorrow morning and answer some questions in the chat. Um, and with that, generally, you know, thank you for coming. And I will then say goodbye to the stream and um, the final, final words to Andreas. Bye. Bye. All right. Let's call call return.